Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at another video from Switch Youth, the Christian organization that made the bold decision to not look up the word Switch on Urban Dictionary to see whether or not it was something that someone with a dirty sense of humor, such as myself, would find amusing before making that their ministry name for all time. And I think they might have become aware of the alternate uses of the word switch now, as they seem to have stopped listing their pastors as switch pastors on the Chirons in their more recent videos. So that's progress, but it's a bit late in the game for a name change. And if they did, then they'd have to explain why, and they probably don't want to get into that, so they're just hoping nobody else will notice. Anyway, in this video they explain why the phrase be true to yourself is terrible advice. I'm not quite sure how they're gonna get there yet, but my money is on it eventually ending up at don't be gay and or trans. So let's take a look! Perfect, we are getting started with the first fill in the blank. Be true to... So originally when I was watching this I thought it'd be a fun little exercise to use Google's autocomplete to fill in the blanks to see what would come up. But they seem to have sold out. Shocker, I know. They suggested be true to Best Buy Canada search. You know, because wading through the first five to ten actual search results that are all ads wasn't annoying enough, so now we get ads in autocomplete as well. So I dusted off the Microsoft Edge browser and I binged it. I risked having an AI fall in love with me and attempt to start an unhealthy relationship for this bit, so goddammit I'm gonna follow through. Bing suggested be true to your school. The correct answer is be true to yourself. If you got it, clap on the back, high five your friend. That's one point for you or zero if you didn't get it. Zero points for Bing. Sorry, Bing. Blank number two. This one might be a little bit tricky. So blank number two, do what makes you... Bing says happy. Do what makes you happy. With a runner up of do what makes you ding. I'm not sure what that's about, but it sounds amusing. Happy, yes. Do what makes you happy. All right, things on the board with one point. And then the third and final blank of our game, you've got to follow your... Bing says, the 2020 film Follow Your Heart. But its first actual autocomplete is legend. Follow your legend. Heart. Yeah, I'll give Bing a half a point for that one. The first result was a movie title that got the answer right, but the first actual autocomplete was Legend. So Bing gets 1.5 out of 3. Honestly, worse than I expected. These are pretty tired cliches at this point, so I figured it would have done better. What's interesting about these three phrases is that they've kind of become like the motto of the modern world. Uh, I mean, yes and no. I think it's pretty well understood that they aren't meant to be something to strictly and literally order your entire life around, but they are decent pieces of advice for finding and creating happiness within your life. But as with all things, moderation is key. Spending your entire life doing nothing but chasing hedonistic pleasures is probably going to leave you either feeling unfulfilled in the long term or without the resources required to continue chasing those pleasures. And when I say hedonistic here, I'm not necessarily referring to sex, although sex is definitely included. It could be anything from living the party life to making sure you have all the latest and greatest PC hardware and buying all the new release AAA video game titles to play on it, and any number of other things. Hedonism is about the pursuit of pleasure, any pleasure, not exclusively sexual pleasure. It's like the key theme in every Disney movie for the last 20 years. It is the message behind so many of our favorite songs on Spotify. Maybe even right now, one of those phrases is actually the quote on the lock screen of your iPhone. I mean, I'm not the most in touch with the latest movies, generally speaking, so maybe there have been a flurry of movies recently that I haven't even heard of yet that do have that kind of message. But like, the recent movies that I've seen, like Lightyear for instance, was about how the pursuit of the one goal you thought was your life's mission to the exclusion of all other considerations ended up being a complete waste. In the end, he had to learn how to adapt to the new situation that he wasn't initially happy with and then pay more attention to the people in his life. 
And then look at another movie like Encanto. That was about learning to forgive those who had hurt you in the past, and coming together as a community to help those in need, as well as learning how to let others help you when you are the one in need. And then just to round out the rule of thirds, the Pinocchio remake is all about a magically sentient puppet learning that poop smells bad. I can't wait to get to school and learn what all this stuff is! Yeah, a lot of movies do include elements or storylines where one of the characters learns that it's okay to be who they are and to not try and change who they are in order to fit in, but that's not exactly a new phenomenon in movies. Hell, arguably Aladdin was more explicitly about being your true, authentic self than any Disney movie of the last five years. But remember, be yourself. And yes, I am aware that the Aladdin remake came out four years ago, and yes, I do think that the 1992 version was more explicitly about that than the remake, but I might also be wrong there, as I didn't find the remake to be very memorable, so I might just not remember that that's what it was about. My point is, in most movies that have a be true to yourself message, it's tempered by a be a good and responsible person message. Here's the problem, though. All three of those phrases are absolutely terrible advice. <laughs> like, none of those are actually going to help you achieve the life that you want. So literally living the life that you want won't help you achieve the life that you want? I mean, I guess if you're all simplistic about it and assume that people who say those things don't understand basic concepts like, if I want the money to do what I want, then I have to find a way of earning an income. But to those of us in the real world, we understand that sometimes you have to do things you don't want to do in order to achieve that which you do want to do. So three reasons being true to yourself is terrible advice. If you are taking notes, you'll want to write this down. Reason number one is because different parts of us want different things. Yeah. That's why prioritization is a good skill to have. Which things do you want more, and why? I can simultaneously want a clean house and want to not clean the house, so I need to find a balance between spending my time doing something I don't want to do and living in a house that isn't as clean as I want it to be. No matter what I choose there, I am going to end up with an unfulfilled want. I mean, I also have an issue with executive dysfunction that plays a role here, where tasks that are physically easy end up being mentally and emotionally challenging for me, but that's a whole other issue. Also, that reminds me, I need to call my doctor to refill my prescription. Well, that was script writing me that had to do that. As video recording me, I can tell you that I did in fact do that, so I have my prescription. Different parts of us want different things. There is a famous psychology test known as the marshmallow experiment. Oh good, I love talking about the marshmallow experiment. If you're unfamiliar, the original experiment put kids in a room in one of four scenarios. In each scenario, they were asked to choose between two treats, either pretzel sticks or animal cookies. Apparently, the original marshmallow experiment didn't actually use marshmallows. Whichever treat they liked more was recorded as their preferred treat. They were then told that they could signal the person who was giving them the treats anytime they wanted, and they would come back into the room, followed by several demonstrations of how exactly that signal worked, where the person would leave the room and the kid would signal them to come back so that they understood how to call back the researcher. Then they had the premise explained to them. The researcher would leave the room, and if the kid can wait until they come back by themselves without the signal, then the kid gets to eat their preferred treat. Otherwise, they get to eat the less preferred treat. This is when they were then split into the four different scenario groups. One group was left alone in the room with neither the preferred nor the unpreferred treat. One group was left with both, and two more groups were left with either just the preferred treat or just the unpreferred treat. The purpose of this experiment was not to test delayed gratification and figure out how it correlates with success later in life. That came from follow-up studies that were done later. The initial purpose of this test was twofold. To figure out when the ability to delay gratification develops in a child in the first place, and to see which scenarios helped with the delaying of gratification and which did not. This study is actually a really good example of a time when scientists found results that ran completely contrary to what they were expecting. They expected that having the preferred treat in the room would help the kids focus on the goal and then serve as a reminder as to why they were waiting, thus helping them wait longer. What they actually found was that the kids who had neither option in front of them during the waiting period did way better at the delayed gratification than any of the other groups, with most of them successfully waiting the full 15 minutes. The average waiting time in the group where both rewards were present was one minute. This is exactly the opposite of what the researchers expected. And also I have to point out here that they looked at the methods the kids used to try and distract themselves during the waiting period, and they were typical kid stuff. Singing songs, making up games to play on their hands and feet, talking to themselves. But one kid in the study is my absolute hero. 
he just straight up took a nap. Now, follow-up studies were done, and this study was repeated with many variations, and researchers found many different factors that could affect a child's ability to delay gratification. For instance, if both rewards were absent, and the child was instructed to think about the abstract qualities of their preferred reward, such as the crunchiness and saltiness of the pretzel sticks, that would increase their ability to delay. But if they were told to think of the actual reward, rather than just its abstract qualities, that lowered their ability to delay. Now, this is a massive oversimplification of the whole body of research, but essentially it can be broken down to two main categories, delay of gratification with frustration, and delay of gratification without frustration. In the original experiment, the reason that the kids without any treats in front of them did better is because they weren't sitting there staring at the treat that they want but can't have yet. It's easier to avoid temptation when the temptation is not present. Now, at this point, people who talk about the marshmallow experiment will usually bring up the fact that there was a correlation between kids who waited longer and certain positive outcomes later in life, such as SAT scores. But there are a couple things to note about these results. First is that the correlation only existed in groups that experienced variations of the experiment that involved frustration. Second is that, again in later studies, it was found that children placed in identical situations but who had opposite experiences regarding the reliability of the researcher had vastly different results. Kids who knew the researcher to be a reliable actor waited an average of 12 minutes and 2 seconds before eating the marshmallow, whereas kids who knew them to be an unreliable actor only waited an average of 3 minutes and 2 seconds. The implication here is that there are all almost certainly confounding variables that can impact both a child's future success in life and their ability to delay gratification, with it not so much being an issue of self-control, but rather it being a rational decision that they're making based on beliefs about how the world operates. So a kid who is raised in an unstable environment where their only guaranteed treat is the one that they already have in their mouths won't necessarily have worse outcomes than a kid who is raised in a stable environment because of a difference in self-control and the ability to delay gratification, but rather the unstable stable environment itself will teach them that delayed gratification will, more often than not, result in a greater loss than if you just take what you can get when you can get it. It's also the kind of environment that leads to less successful outcomes generally. So basically, psychology is complicated, there are a million factors that could impact the results, all of these factors are related to each other in different ways, with some being causal links, others being purely correlational, and most being a mix of causal and correlational. So keep that in mind every time this series of studies is mentioned. Usually it will be in the context of the power of delayed gratification, when not only was that not the original purpose of the study, but also the causal link between kids who were unable or unwilling to delay their gratification in this particular experiment and the results later in life is not well established, with the existence of a myriad of confounding factors. The author of the original study even wrote a book in 2014 explaining some of the implications of the experiments that often go unnoticed by the media, but also to talk about the results of these various experiments in light of all the recent research that's been done on executive function. And this actually stood out to me while I was reading through the study that looked at outcomes later in life. Basically every measure that they looked at would be something that someone with ADHD would struggle with. If you're unfamiliar, ADHD is essentially a lack of executive function. People with ADHD have trouble with things like making and executing plans, the ability to concentrate on tasks that they don't find mentally stimulating, impulse control, self-regulation, and things like that. And that's basically the exact list of outcomes that they looked at for these correlations, which are not necessarily indicators of actual success in life. As someone with ADHD, these are all things that I struggle with myself. But I consider my life to be pretty successful. I have a job that allows me to go down the hyper-focused rabbit trail on things like the marshmallow test, and rewards me for coming up with new and interesting angles from which to look at the same tired old claims. I make enough money that I'm not worried about feeding my family. I have good relationships with my kids. I have family and friends that I love and who love me. I have a girlfriend who thinks that all my quirks that in almost every other setting in my life have been annoyances to the people around me are actually charming. So by these measures, which are the ones that are most important to me, I have a successful life. But if we just look at tasks related to executive function, my life's a complete mess. There's always a pile of dirty dishes. There's always multiple mountains of laundry in various locations throughout the house. I don't have impulse control. If there's snacks in the house, then there aren't snacks in the house because I ate them all. We eat fast food more often than we should because I'll get lost in some hyperfixation until it's too late to start cooking, and that's assuming that I remembered to buy groceries in the first place. Hell, the writing of this script is what reminded me to call my doctor for a prescription refill, and now it just reminded me to put in a grocery order. 
Again, that was script writing me. Video recording me can confirm that I did indeed put in a grocery order. So not only do the correlation of the kids' abilities to delay gratification in these studies with successful outcomes later in life not necessarily mean that their ability to delay gratification is what caused those successful outcomes, but whether or not those particular outcomes should even be the primary measure of what constitutes success is in doubt. The whole point of this experiment was to measure these young people's ability to delay gratification. Now, the whole point of this series of experiments was to figure out at what age the ability to delay gratification develops, and to figure out which set of circumstances would help with the delaying of gratification and which would hinder it, to figure out which external variables could also be playing a role, and really a whole host of other things. We're talking dozens of studies conducted over the course of the last half century. You can't break this down into one simple statement like that. The reason why this is so important, though, for us to wrap our minds around is because just like those preschoolers, all of us are going to find ourselves in situations where we have a choice to make. Do I say yes to one marshmallow right now, or do I say no to it so I can say yes to two marshmallows later? Now, keep in mind, he's saying this in the context of telling us that do what makes you happy is bad advice. So he just said that you should avoid what will make you a little bit happy now in order to be able to do something that will make you more happy later. In other words, do what makes you happy while considering the big picture. It's literally the same advice, he's just assuming that anyone who says do what makes you happy is completely ignorant of the fact that the time dimension exists. Right, like, do I say yes to going to bed on time so I can wake up tomorrow full of energy and rested for the big test, or do I say yes to scrolling TikTok until four o'clock in the morning, knowing that that's gonna mean I'm gonna wake up tomorrow, past my bedtime, late for school, rushed, and not at all mentally prepared for the test that is going to determine my grade this year? Well, that depends very much on your goals here. This video is directed at high school students, so this is in the context of a high school class, I would think. So do you plan on attending an Ivy League university that's going to actually look at your high school transcript to see what your grades are when considering you in a pile of thousands of applicants, many of whom will be turned down? Then maybe go to bed early. Do you plan on going to community college, which doesn't really care all that much about your grades? Then your grades in high school aren't really as important. Do you have a high enough grade in that class already that flunking that test won't really hurt you? Do you even plan on going to college? What grade are you in? Even if you plan on going to a high-end university, it's very doubtful that a single low test score in grade 9 is going to affect your outcome. But if this is your grade 12 biology final exam, and you plan on going into a field related to biology, then that is a much more important grade. You also have to consider, is this something that you do frequently? If you're always up until 4am scrolling TikTok, then that's a habit that you should probably try to break. But if you're normally very good about going to bed at a reasonable hour, but you've had a stressful week and this is how you unwind, then the occasional late night binge might actually be good for you. With emphasis on occasional here. My point is that there will very rarely be one single correct answer that is applicable to everyone in every situation. Also, note the use of a device with a screen as the temptation here. In society today, we're kind of predisposed to think of screen time as a negative thing, especially for kids. And not without reason. But replace scrolling TikTok with reading books, and this becomes a very different scenario in a lot of people's minds, even if it is effectively the same thing. And the reason why they're studying this is because almost everybody agrees that our ability to say no to things in the moment, so we can say yes to better things in the future, has a huge impact on the overall well being of our lives. And there it is, the connection to well-being, without mention of the fact that the measurements of well-being used for these studies were things that are not necessarily indicative of actual well-being, but are instead indicative of the strength of executive function. Now, I am not saying that the complete lack of the ability to delay gratification is always going to be a good thing. It's definitely not. Having an executive function deficit makes a lot of things that are not only necessary, but that most people consider to be relatively easy, extraordinarily difficult. Like, most people don't have a hard time picking socks up off the floor and putting them in a laundry hamper. And intellectually, I know that that's not a difficult task. But a lot of times, I just can't. I can't do it. I want to, I know it would make me feel better about my bedroom, but for whatever reason, I just can't. 
The analogy that I've heard that I think explains this feeling pretty well is comparing it to when your arm falls asleep. Like you've completely lost all feeling in your arm, not the pins and needles asleep, it's just gone. You can't move your arm when that happens. You know intellectually that it is your arm. Your brain should be able to control it. You know that moving your arm is not a hard thing to do, but no matter how hard you try, it just won't move. You just have to wait a bit until you get to the pins and needles stage before eventually getting back to normalcy. That's what it's like to have executive dysfunction and see tasks that you know are easy, you know you are physically capable of doing, you just can't. Now, I'm not saying that this is an ideal way to live as long as you are happy and fulfilled in other areas of your life, but what I am saying is that the measurements of success being used here are not necessarily indicative of what actual success might look like. Rather, they are measurements of executive function. I do not define success in life by how much executive function I have. I define it by the things I mentioned earlier. My relationships, my ability to provide for my kids, my overall happiness. In fact, for me, one of the measurements of success is how much I am able to let go of the idea that my success is tied to my ability to do things that neurotypical people don't even have a hard time with in the first place. Whenever I expressed dissatisfaction with my mountains of laundry, my therapist would suggest that perhaps it might be better for me to just accept the fact that I'm going to have a messier house than most people. As long as it doesn't get to the point where it's a health concern, just accept that that's how it's going to be and find other measurements of success that I can use. So my ability to stop feeling guilty about Mount Laundry is something that I could consider a marker of success, where these studies would put the existence of Mount Laundry firmly in the category of undesirable outcome. My point here is that success is defined differently by different people, and everyone gets to define what success is for themselves. So it's almost like you should just be true to yourself and do what makes you happy and what makes you feel like you're successful. And this is why being true to ourselves can be challenging. Because in those scenarios, what part of ourselves are we supposed to be true to? <laughs> well, it depends very much on the individual and the individual scenario. The problem here is that you seem to be criticizing the advice for being too generalized, all while solving the problem with advice that you think should be generalized to everyone in every scenario. This is why it's actually good advice. Be true to yourself. What should be considered successful will be different for everyone, and the very limited measurements they used in the marshmallow experiments will not be applicable to everyone. I've given my perspective as someone who has ADHD, but even someone who is neurotypical might have different goals and aspirations that render some of those markers of success irrelevant. Hell, if I were to successfully keep a mostly clean house for a month, I would consider that a great success, while someone else would just see that as the baseline, nothing to get excited about there. So does delayed gratification lead to success? Yeah, it can. But what is considered success will vary greatly from person to person, and the amount of delayed gratification needed to get these varying levels of success will also vary greatly. So in the end, you need to figure out what counts as success for you personally, setting realistic expectations, being aware of your limitations. In other words, success is best measured by your ability to be true to yourself. No one else can define success for you, and no cookie cutter explanation will fit everyone. Right, like the part that wants this marshmallow right now, or the part that wants another marshmallow later. Even just that one example has a considerable amount of variability. What are your goals here? Are you trying to lose weight? Well then one marshmallow now is a nice treat without going overboard. Do you successfully avoid indulging in most scenarios, but sometimes give in and have the occasional treat? then, you know, waiting for the second marshmallow is a nice little reward that won't throw things off track. Are you a vegetarian and the marshmallow being presented is made with non-vegetarian gelatin? Then you don't want any of them in the first place, so the ability to resist temptation doesn't even come into play. And I could keep going, there are a myriad of different ways of looking at this that each could be successful even if you eat the first marshmallow without waiting for the second. The second reason is because our strongest desires are very rarely our deepest desires. Our strongest desires are rarely our deepest desires. So for example, imagine you are scrolling through Instagram and you see that picture of a really attractive person. Now you have a choice to make. Do you act on the really strong desires that are urging you to objectify them and see them as nothing more than an object to drool over? 
or do you listen to the deepest and truest parts of you? Well, objectification is a real problem, but as with most things, moderation is key. I know you have to keep things PG here because of the Christian pretend prudery, so you're talking about Instagram rather than like actual porn, but porn use is okay. Now, ideally, you should make sure that whatever porn you use is ethical, and that everyone involved actually wants to be there and has given full consent, and you should be aware that porn is usually not an accurate depiction of real sex. But that doesn't mean there's something inherently wrong with the idea of pornography. And the main reason that I say that Christian prudery is pretend prudery is because they don't seem to get all that upset by actual sexual immorality. In fact, when legislation is proposed in the United States to make child marriage illegal, it's the conservative Christian politicians and lobby groups that oppose it. There are only six states that have an outright ban on child marriage, and the first of them only implemented it in 2018. If Christians were really concerned about sexual immorality, they wouldn't worry about people masturbating when they get a bit horny. They'd be worried about the fact that in most places in the United States, a grown-ass adult can marry a literal child. A 2021 study estimated that almost 300,000 minors were married in the US between 2000 and 2018, and more than 80% of those are young girls being forced into marriages with adult men. And this is just A-OK -okay with all those Christian groups with the word family in their name. But if two adult men want to marry each other? That's too many penises. It's icky. We can't allow that. It should be illegal. The priorities are all way off. That want to honor that person as a human being with dignity made in the image of God. I don't know. Maybe I think God's sexy. Okay, but anyways, the whole made in the image of God thing is irrelevant, but you do realize that it's entirely possible to be sexually attracted to someone and also to honor and respect them and their dignity as a human being, right? That's why ethical porn is important. It's how you make sure that everyone involved is actually happy with their decision to be there, and in an actual relationship, it's possible to love and respect someone, but also to be sexually attracted to them. In fact, a lot of people really enjoy when their partner gets turned on by them. Part of respecting their human dignity is in recognizing that they can enjoy being the object of your desire. Now, keep in mind this is with reference to an actual relationship, not a parasocial relationship. The Instagram model who you've never met doesn't want to hear about how turned on you get when you see them. Sending messages like that would indeed fall into the category of not respecting their dignity as a human being. But it is possible to have sexual arousal and desire, outside of marriage, while still respecting these people as human beings. Or maybe you're alone late at night with your boyfriend or girlfriend, and things are getting a little bit heated. You find yourself getting close to crossing a line. Then keep it safe and make sure everyone's consenting. And all of a sudden, you've got these desires in you that are saying, go all the way, cross the line. It's going to feel so good. Is that really what you want most for you or for them? Here's the thing. Those desires are normal and natural, and they are something that most people feel. Shout out to the aces who often get forgotten about when talking about sex in contexts like this. To tell people that those feelings are something that they should not have in the first place is one of the ways that religion is used to control people. You're experiencing these feelings that nearly everyone has, and you give in to them sometimes. Well, you better come to us, give us 10% of your income, and beg for forgiveness for being a dirty, filthy sinner. Also, this is in the context of delaying gratification so that you can get something better at a later time. What is the better thing in this instance? If the sex is safe and consensual, it can do things like strengthen the emotional bond between the people involved, improving their relationship. It can also have certain health benefits like lowering blood pressure, relieving certain types of pain, improving sleep quality, lowering stress, and a whole host of other benefits. Now, yes, there are certain risks associated with sex, but comprehensive sex education can significantly mitigate those risks, essentially making it all upside, no downside. Now, what benefit do you have if you delay sex? Some socially constructed purity crap that isn't actually real. No, you aren't a piece of used chewing gum if you've had sex in the past. That's another control thing. God can make you pure again, but you have to come to church and give us 10% of your income to show that you really want God to make you pure again. Or is the thing that you want most to honor them by not putting them in a situation where their desires in the moment might lead them to make a decision that they will later regret? That's why education about consent is important. Everyone involved needs to be enthusiastically consenting. 
But also, I think sex needs to be taken off the pedestal that it gets put up on. If you have fully enthusiastic consenting sex with someone, then even if you later come to despise that person, that doesn't retroactively make the sex a bad thing that needs to be regretted and atoned for. That just means that future sex with them is off the table. If your first time is with someone that you don't end up spending the rest of your life with, that's okay. The first time doesn't need to be some big special moment. In fact, most people out here in the real world will tell you that their first time was kind of shit. Like, in my case, I was literally a three-pump chump. It was so exciting to me that I was finally doing this thing that had been made out to be some massively huge deal that the very excitement made it one of, if not the most, mediocre sexual experiences of my life. So yeah, you put that much emphasis on how important it is to save yourself from marriage, which is a gross way to phrase it that reinforces the chewed gum analogy, combined with how sex is put up on a pedestal, and then if someone actually manages to successfully wait until marriage, they're likely going to have a bad time on their wedding night. Now, don't get me wrong, if someone wants to wait until marriage, that's their decision. That's part of the consent talk. If your partner wants to wait, and you pressure them into not waiting, that is a violation of their consent. So again, education that includes discussions of consent is really what is key here. And oftentimes the desires that feel the strongest and yell the loudest are not the desires that are the deepest and truest parts of us. Because the deepest and truest parts of you are the fact that you have been made in the image of God. Yep, there's the control. The parts of you that come naturally aren't actually true to you. What's really true to you is that you are made in the image of God. So you have to behave in a way that we, the church, the representatives of God here on earth, approve of. And any deviation cannot be accepted. If you deviate, you have to ask for forgiveness. And don't forget to tithe. The third reason is because the life that we want to live in the future doesn't actually come from staying who we are. It comes from going into who we are meant to be. Two things here. First, that's what she said. Second, I don't think anyone who uses the be true to yourself thing as a motto or whatever would be against the idea of personal growth. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that be true to yourself would include being true to your picture of who you want to become in the future. When I was in high school and middle school, I didn't want anything to do with faith or Jesus or church. I was pretty convinced that it was all a fairy tale made up so that other people could feel better about themselves. And my mom easily could have said, hey, just be true to yourself. Just keep doing whatever you want. Who cares about the church thing? But instead she told me, hey, if you're gonna live in my house, you're gonna go to church. And so week in and week out, I went to church because that was cheaper than finding somewhere else to live and paying rent. In other words, you were forcefully indoctrinated into your religion before your brain had fully developed. Also, if you thought that Christianity was a fairy tale made up to make people feel better about themselves, then you didn't know much about Christianity. Its whole thing is making you feel guilty about who you are. You were born a filthy, dirty sinner. You're unworthy. God becoming human was super degrading to God because he's lowering himself to your level. We don't deserve his grace and mercy because we're so horrible, etc., etc., etc. In Luke chapter nine, Jesus says this. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple, that's another word for follower, must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Deny themselves, not be true to themselves. Take up their cross daily, not do what makes them happy and follow me, not follow their hearts. Keep in mind, though, that this was written in a time when Christians were an extreme minority, when becoming Christian would actually result in a certain amount of hardship. Today in the United States, being a Christian is essentially playing life on easy mode. I mean, often businesses will go out of their way to include Christian imagery in their logos, because when a Christian is deciding between using the services of two competing businesses, they're going to lean toward the business that obviously signals that they are of the same religion. Being a Christian today is not taking up your cross and denying yourself, it's taking the socially easy route. But why is it that Jesus said this? Well, the next line is the answer. In Luke 24, 9, 24, Jesus says that whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. 
Yeah, but is it really losing your life for Jesus to be a Christian in a majority Christian country where it's significantly easier to be a Christian than any other religion or to have no religion at all? Like, yeah, it is slowly getting easier to be non-Christian in the United States, but because of verses like this one, Christians see the equal treatment of other religions and the lack of religion as persecution. If they can't have extra privileges, it must be persecution because it's stressed over and over again in the New Testament that to be a Christian is going to include being persecuted and being hated by the world. So if they admit that they are the majority and have an inordinate amount of power and control over the world, then that's an admission that they aren't really Christians, because part of being Christian is to be persecuted for it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Doesn't that kind of defeat your point? Like that last question is basically, what good is it to gain all this stuff if at the end of it, you aren't true to yourself? Now you might be hearing this and think, okay, cool. Like that sounds nice, but why should I actually do that? Yeah, actually my thoughts are closer to that sounds terrible. Why would anyone do that? Like, why should I actually make that a part of my life? And, and I would offer you two reasons, whether you're a Christian or not, because the truth is, what so many of us want, a disciplined life and loving relationships, can't happen without self-denial. Okay, but self-denial in what way? In a healthy relationship, both people will do a certain amount of self-denial in order to do something for the other at some point. Even acts as small as changing a baby's diaper when there are other things that you'd rather be doing are a form of self-denial. You don't need Jesus for that, and that can still count as being true to yourself because you want to be a good parent and partner. Another way to say it is that self-denial is an essential ingredient for building a disciplined life and loving relationships. Okay, but again, there's no Jesus required here, and that is still being true to yourself. Self-denial is not the opposite of being true to yourself, it just depends on what your goals for yourself are. But real love is not trying to get something from someone else. It is sacrificing yourself for the good of another. Not exclusively, no. A real loving relationship is a two-way street where both parties are willing to make sacrifices for the other, but also have needs that they should be able to expect will be fulfilled by the other person. If your part of the relationship is all give and no take, then that's not a healthy relationship. And part of a healthy relationship is being able to express your needs to the other person and to have them listen to you and put in effort to fulfill those needs. And this is where Christian relationship advice often fails because it will frequently fall into advice on how if you sacrifice for your partner and make sure all their needs are thoroughly met, then without expressing your own needs, they will just start to automatically meet your needs because they are so happy with their needs being met. And that's just not how it works. It gets really gross when you look at the relationship books directed specifically at women, where the authors will explicitly come right out and say that women should just give their husbands all the sex that they want, in the hopes that this will result in their husbands meeting more of their needs now that they are sexually fulfilled. To quote the book The Power of a Praying Wife, for a wife, sex comes out of affection. She doesn't want to be affectionate with a man who makes her feel angry, hurt, lonely, disappointed, overworked, unsupported, uncared for, or abandoned. But for a husband, sex is pure need. His eyes, ears, brain, and emotions get clouded if he doesn't have that release. He has trouble hearing anything his wife says or seeing what she needs when that area of his is being neglected. Wives sometimes have it backwards. They think, we can have sex after we get those other issues settled. But actually, there is a far greater chance of settling the other issues if sex comes first. That sends the disgusting message that if a woman is unhappy in her marriage, then giving her husband all the sex that he wants is what she should do in order to get him to even just think about maybe addressing the fact that she feels angry, hurt, lonely, disappointed, overworked, unsupported, uncared for, or abandoned. This is a common thread in many Christian relationship books, and it sets the stage for an abusive relationship, not a healthy one. If one partner is unwilling to even attempt to meet the other person's needs without being sexually satisfied first, then telling the neglected partner that they have to be willing to sacrifice and give without thought of receiving anything for themselves is not going to lead to a healthy and loving relationship. Each person in the relationship should feel comfortable both expressing their needs and being willing to listen to the other person when they express their needs. So here are 
three suggestions on how to actually do it. Suggestion number one is decide what you really want most. But you, you, you can't say yes to what you want most if you don't even know what it is. <laughs> okay, sure. That is decent advice. Though I feel like you wouldn't approve of people deciding that they want anything most that isn't a relationship with Jesus or whatever. <laughs> so start by deciding what you really want most. Second thing is practice saying no to what you want now. Again, decent advice. I'm not against the practicing of delayed gratification. I just don't like that he's making it out like delayed gratification is a Christianity versus the world issue when that's just flat out not true. Suggestion number three would be to find people who can help. And yet again, that's not bad advice. This is kind of reminding me of Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules book, where if you just read the chapter titles, the advice isn't really all that bad. A bit cliche maybe, but not harmful. But as soon as he starts explaining what he means in the various chapters, it gets real bad real fast. And that's where I'll leave it. The rest of their video is essentially just an altar call. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Leo Aguinaldo, who says, if God exists, he doesn't need anybody to explain his existence. And that right there is, in my opinion, one of the strongest pieces of evidence that shows that a God who wants us to believe in him does not actually exist. Such a God would not need humans to argue him into existence. He would just make sure that we all know. He wouldn't need a human copied book to explain his will. He would just communicate it to us in a way that is reliable. The fact that apologist is a job that exists is itself evidence against what the apologists are arguing for. Thanks for watching, thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and sponsorship manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Joaquim Schoeder and all the rest, who are the self-help gurus that tell you to be true to my channel. If you would like pretty much all apologists and self-help gurus to pretend like they are the only ones who actually understand that phrase in more than just a superficial manner, then you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my PO Box address is in the description. See you next time! which is a Christian organization that decided not to look up the word switch on Urban Dictionary to see whether it was something that someone with a dirty sense of humor might find to be amusing. Why are you not working today, teleprompter? God damn it, what are you, what? Why? Why are you doing that? You can hear me. You're plugged in, right? Yeah? Hello, testing, audio. Yeah, audio's going through. Why are you not hearing me? Scroll, 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 what the fuck? Scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. Yeah, that's why prioritization. Here you go, good job. The problem here is that my auto prompter thingy's not scrolling is what the problem here is. Come on. Yeah, now you go. What the fuck? Mm. 58. God damn it. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Joaquim, Joaquim, it's not a hard word, to, it's not a hard name. Why am I tripping over Joaquim? Joaquim, Joachim, should I say Joachim? Nah.